This exhibition is very important because it's the first time that we are collaborating and that we're trying to show the interdisciplinary nature of culture in the Americas. Orellana is a key example of how music has influenced visual arts all over the continent and over its history. This is the first exhibition of Joaquin Orellana in the United States, organized along with the music department of America Society. It was programmed by my predecessor, Gabriela Rangel, in connection with Sebastián Subieta, the director of music, and is curated by him and Diana Plato, our assistant curator. Joaquin Oriana is a Guatemalan musician and composer, and he has invented these instruments that he calls the udiles sonoros, and that's part of what will be exhibited in the American Society exhibition. He was born in Guatemala in 1930, and he lived there most of his life, except for a couple of years that he spent in Buenos Aires in the late 60s. He was a fellow at the Ditela. What makes Oriana different from other composers, that uh, from other avant-garde composers that have been working the you know, past 50 years, is that he invented a bunch of instruments, different models of instruments that help, helped him create his, the sound world that he needed. The instruments that Oriana makes are mostly based on the marimba, so they're a percussion instrument, and I'm the visual person on this side, but they have um, a resonator that comes off the bottom. And we learned actually while we were speaking with Joaquin Oriana in his studio that the shape of the instrument originates from the gesture. So it's not a sculpture in the sense that he's making the image first, but he knows you want this to be played like this and he makes an imbaluna. Right, that was really, really remarkable when he showed us that, that side of it. It's like, I wanted this. So he put a thing, as Anna said, that goes with that shape. So what happened to him, he was a composer and violinist living in Guatemala City. 30-something, he goes to Buenos Aires to a center that had all the resources and all the contacts with the leading thing, you know, the, the cutting edge of, of musical composition at the time. Among those things, what the Ditella had was a very, very important electronic music studio. So he goes back and he says, I still need these sounds. How do I make them? And that's, that's what started. The, this idea. For a composer to sculpt an instrument is very unique. Uh, most musical instruments are made you know in workshops and it's very specialized but it's more of a trade as opposed to an aesthetic practice and these are completely different. They don't even have a score that is a familiar score. The notation is super specialized and we'll actually have one of the scores the manuscript for the work that we commissioned in the exhibition for people to see that. And it is one of two pieces that he has written only for the instruments. That's the thing. He has his, um, his catalog is about 50, 60 works altogether. But many of them are for these instruments plus regular standard instruments or choirs or different things. But this is the second piece that he's written only for the, for the, sound, for the sound tools. So in addition to Joaquin Oriana's work, we'll be featuring this other side of his legacy, which is his relationship to contemporary art. So we'll have work by artists including Carlos Amorales, Akira Ikezoe, Alberto Rodriguez Colia, and Maria Adela Diaz. And all of them have different relationships to the work, whether it's to his sound, to the notation of his musical scores, or to the instruments themselves. Going just by the connection to the contemporary artist, his, he has a studio in the basement of uh, the National Theater in Guatemala. That's where his, his stuff lives. So it's a big room with all the instruments, a little workshop in which his team re repairs and builds new stuff. But that place became kind of a pilgrimage site. So many artists have gone there walking through those hallways that we have on video. And they go into this maze of the, of the theater and you get there. And so many people have done this, this trip. And they've been very inspired by the shapes and the sounds or different aspects as Diana said.
One thing that's really important and interesting about Oriana's work to me, besides just the visual or materiality or the sound, is his relationship to Guatemalan culture and indigeneity. And he has these compositions that have highlighted, you know, the issues from when he started in the 70s through today, having to do with violence against indigenous people and the civil wars at those times. Guatemala was in the middle of a very, very bad civil war for 40 years. So when he went back, there was still 25 more years until the peace was signed. So that uh, violence, especially against indigenous peoples, that, that was really, really pronounced in Guatemala is very present. This idea of justice and of, of sound justice, of justice that is, and, and the sound of the people, he was, he's very, very committed to that. This is the first time that, to our knowledge, the visual arts and music departments of America Society are working together. You know, we have done projects in common, but from different angles and a concept, but I don't think we've had sound producing sculptures, to put it away, in, in the past. So I think it is the first time. So for me, it's super interesting. I've learned a lot about music and music history, but also my personal interest in visual art is about the intersection of these different disciplines. So whether it's visual art and literature and performance, um, it's nice to be able to work with an artist who's also a musician and with these artists who have an interest in his work. Collaborating and discussing things with a person that sees the world with her eyes instead of with her ears. So it's really, it's a totally different experience. And I think it's really, I mean, for me, it's been great in that sense. I didn't know you could look at things that way. <laughs>